Hello, thank you for this opportunity to talk with you about the work we're doing at Oregon Health and Science University, studying circulating hybrid cells in uveal melanoma. I practice ocular oncology at OHSU, where I direct the ocular oncology division at the KCI Institute and the ocular melanoma program for the Knight Cancer Institute. The work I'll discuss today is made possible by the dedication and coordination of a large research team. In particular, I'd like to acknowledge my collaborator, Dr. Missy Wong. It's been a real pleasure to partner with Dr. Wong in investigating this tumor cell population recently discovered in her lab within the uveal melanoma space. Our work is supported by multiple foundation grants, including the Melanoma Research Foundation, the National Institutes of Health, and the Department of Defense. And we're grateful for the support that allows us to pursue this science. Most importantly, I want to thank my patients those who get this view of me more than they would probably like. The work I'm going to present is informed by and inspired by my patients, and their willingness to participate in this and other studies is a contribution that cannot be overstated. As most in this audience are aware, ocular melanoma or uveal melanoma can arise from the iris, ciliary body, or choroid. Posterior uveal melanomas arising from the ciliary body or choroid are aggressive cancers with high risk for metastatic disease. Unlike most cancers, uveal melanoma is typically a clinical diagnosis made without tissue biopsy. Expert ocular oncologists can recognize the signs of melanoma in the eye by doing examinations and imaging studies in most cases. But identification of uveal melanoma typically requires eye examination through a dilated pupil. Without dilation, much of the back part of the eye cannot be examined, and a tumor could go undetected because symptoms are often a late finding. This patient was asymptomatic, but had a large melanoma in the eye. Smaller melanomas can be more challenging to diagnose than large tumors. These tumors exist on a clinical spectrum from those that are clearly benign nevi to those with typical features of melanoma. A lot of the patients that ocular oncologists see fall into this middle category of indeterminate tumors. These are situations where we really can't differentiate between a benign or a cancerous lesion based solely on clinical features, and our options are to observe closely or to treat with potentially vision-threatening treatments. Biopsy is also an option, but can be challenging for these small tumors, and at this time is rarely performed for diagnostic purposes. Tumors consistent with melanoma are treated. Benign nevi and many indeterminate tumors are observed closely for growth or surface changes that are consistent with malignant transformation into melanoma, as shown here in two examples from my practice. When a melanoma is diagnosed in the eye, it's treated with removal of the eye, a surgery called a nucleation, or if possible, with eye-sparing treatments, most commonly radiation therapy. Since the 1970s, we're saving more and more eyes with radiation therapy, However, we unfortunately don't seem to be saving more lives. The survival rate for uveal melanoma has remained stable for several decades, as shown on the graph on the right. Why is the survival curve flat? Well, it's related to several clinical challenges. Late presentation is common due to lack of systematic screening, late vision symptoms, and lack of awareness of the disease. The I Get Dilated campaign is an excellent way that the Melanoma Research Foundation is working on this issue. In addition, when small tumors are identified, our desire to preserve vision may delay definitive treatment. Local treatment of the intraocular tumor does not treat cancer cells that have already spread outside of the eye, and no curative therapies exist for metastatic disease. Treatment of the primary tumor in the eye with either radiation or nucleation is highly successful with low rates of local recurrence, but up to 50% of patients go on to develop metastatic spread of disease despite successful treatment of the eye tumor. This is due to the presence of microscopic spread of melanoma that occurs typically prior to treatment of the eye, we believe. We monitor patients with serial body imaging to detect metastatic spread of uveal melanoma. This comes at considerable financial and emotional cost. And currently, what results in a happy, healthy patient outcome with a durable cure as compared to an outcome in which a patient develops fatal metastatic disease, remains poorly understood. Metastasis, or distant spread of ocular melanoma, occurs almost entirely via the bloodstream. Cells invade into the blood vessels, survive in circulation, move into secondary tissue, most commonly the liver, and colonize. 
They may then remain dormant for years, even decades, before leading to tumors we can find on imaging. This process, which likely involves a breakdown in the immune system, is poorly understood. Work done in multiple labs in the last decade has improved our understanding of the evolution of uveal melanoma from nevus to primary and even metastatic melanoma. A melanocyte undergoes a G-alpha-Q mutation to allow it to become a precursor lesion, like a choroidal nevus. Over time, in a minority of these benign tumors, additional mutations and chromosomal changes may occur, allowing a melanoma to develop. It's important to note that while we're not entirely sure when the process of microscopic spread begins, data suggests that this may occur early in some patients when tumors remain small and easily confused with nevi. There's currently no reliable method for detecting microscopic disease in uveal melanoma. These small nests of cells cannot be seen with MRI, CT scan, or ultrasound. While we can't determine which patients have microscopic spread of their melanoma, there are a number of ways to help predict risk. Anatomic cancer staging has been shown in retrospective studies to predict outcome. This method relies on categorization, primarily based upon tumor size and location. Even better for predicting metastasis is molecular testing, but these tests require tumor tissue obtained by biopsy or enucleation. Biopsy carries risk to the patient, cannot be repeated, and may be inaccurate in situations of tumor heterogeneity. There's been considerable interest in liquid biopsy in our field. Liquid biopsies are blood-based tests that don't require tumor tissue. They can help in early detection of cancer, improve prognostication, treatment selection, and even identification of new treatments. In particular, circulating tumor cells, or CTCs, are of interest because although they're rare, they provide a source of tumor DNA and have cellular features that may inform us about the disease. There are commercial CTC platforms for, in use for a variety of cancers, including breast, colorectal, and prostate cancers. However, exploration of traditional circulating CTCs in uveal melanoma has been disappointing. Although there are a number of studies, some of which have suggested prognostic value for CTCs, low cell numbers have limited their utility. But what if we've simply been missing the population of true interest? Today, I'll tell you about the discovery of novel cell fusion hybrids in cancer, the studies that have been conducted in Dr. Wong's lab to explore their impact on tumor progression, and our foray into establishing their potential use as a non-invasive, blood-based biomarker for disease status in cancers including uveal melanoma. Many of the experiments I'll show are based upon the principle shown above. Fluorescent labeling of cells allows us to label cancer cells and immune cells called macrophages. In this cartoon, red fluorescent protein, or RFP, labels the tumor cell nucleus, and green fluorescent protein, or GFP, labels the macrophage, a type of immune cell. The resulting fusion hybrid cell co-expresses both RFP and GFP. Using this dual marker system, the Wong lab observed spontaneous fusion of cancer cells expressing RFP with mouse macrophages expressing GFP when they were co-cultured in a tissue culture dish. Seen here, a hybrid that expresses both GFP from the macrophage and possesses an RFP nucleus. And because seeing is believing, this is live imaging of co-cultured cancer cells with red nuclei and GFP expressing macrophages. You'll see here that these two cells undergo a fusion event and the resulting hybrid cell is now able to migrate about the dish. Moreover, this fusion hybrid undergoes cell division or mitosis seen here to generate two identical hybrid cells. In order to evaluate a role for cell fusion in metastatic spread of cancer, the Wong lab moved their studies into animal model systems. In a mouse model, to demonstrate that hybrid cells are formed in primary tumors, a melanoma cell line that expressed RFP was injected into the dermis in mice that expressed GFP. Tumors developed and were surgically removed, and RFP-GFP co-expressing hybrid tumor cells, similar to those observed in cell culture studies, were identified. To demonstrate that cell fusion is relevant to human disease, a creative approach was taken in which female patients who had received gender mismatched bone marrow transplants and then developed a secondary cancer were studied. 
In this scenario, the Y chromosome from transplanted male bone marrow cells functions as a fusion indicator. This is a pancreatic adenocarcinoma tumor stained with antibodies to cytokeratin to mark tumor cells. You can see their outlines in white. Y chromosomes are detected in red. The presence of the Y chromosomes from the male bone marrow transplant inside of the nuclei of the cancer cells supports that the bone marrow cells, which are primarily immune cells, have fused with cancer cells. These hybrids were readily detectable throughout the tumor tissue. We've gone on to determine that hybrids are readily detectable in numerous cancer sites in both primary and metastatic tumors, including uveal melanoma. And thus, it stands to reason that if hybrid cells are present in the primary and metastatic tumor, they're likely to be found in the peripheral blood. As we talked about earlier, spread of cancers often, and in uveal melanoma almost entirely, involves spread through the bloodstream. Our early experiments had shown that the hybrid or fusion cells were found in both the primary and metastatic tumors, so we hypothesized that they were also likely to be found in the bloodstream. We set out to determine if there were hybrid cells in circulation. When tumors are surgically removed in the mouse model previously shown, blood was also obtained to look for hybrids. This, um, the way this was done was using a technique called flow cytometry. In this technique, cells pass single file through a laser, which can distinguish them by physical and chemical properties, such as fluorescent labeling. In this case, the melanoma cells fluoresce in red and the mouse immune cells fluoresce in green. If desired, this technique can also be used to collect cells of a specific type for additional testing. In the blood, RFP expressing tumor cells were identified by flow cytometry shown in the yellow box on the right-hand side of this plot. And of these tumor cells, the majority were hybrid cells expressing both RFP and GFP, making up more than 90% of the tumor cells in circulation. Interestingly, conventionally defined circulating tumor cells, or CTCs, are cells that express a tumor marker like RFP in our experiment, but don't express a marker called CD45, which is found on immune cells. So we set out to determine if hybrid cells express CD45, and sure enough, because they're derived from fusion with an immune cell, they did. Interestingly, the CTC field has overlooked the circulating tumor cell population. Using CD45 as a marker for hybrid cells, we were now able to assess hybrids in human cancer patients. The cells we were interested in would express the immune marker and tumor cell markers. In patients with various stages of pancreatic cancer, we found CTCs and hybrid cells across all stages of disease. However, the hybrid cells shown in red, or CHCs, far outnumbered CTCs, and in the metastatic setting, were more abundant by an order of magnitude. In addition, when we took the patient cohort and split them into high and low levels of hybrid cells, we determined that patients with high CHCs had poor survival, regardless of their stage. This was not true for CTCs. Funding from multiple foundation grants is currently supporting our investigation of CHCs in uveal melanoma. We're excited about their potential impact as an informative liquid biopsy. Currently, we're investigating whether evaluation of peripheral blood for circulating hybrid cells may prove to be a reliable, non-invasive biomarker in uveal melanoma, allowing us to evaluate patients at the time the eye tumor is treated, as well as follow them over time. We hypothesize that these cells may serve as a renewable source for molecular prognostic testing, and that monitoring CHC levels may allow for earlier diagnosis of metastatic disease than currently available imaging techniques. We're also interested in whether detection of CHCs may prove helpful in making the initial diagnosis in cases of diagnostic uncertainty. As mentioned earlier, CHCs are detected in blood samples of patients with uveal melanoma. Here I'm showing you hybrids detected in a preparation of peripheral blood and mononuclear cells, where hybrids express both a melanoma marker in orange and CD45, an immune cell marker in green. As with other organ sites, CTCs are detectable in uveal melanoma, but at far lower numbers than CHCs. We have the ability to isolate CHCs and are engaged in molecularly profiling these cells to test their utility in providing mutational profiles that may align with the primary tumor in the eye. I'd also like to share some preliminary data showing an example of detection of CHCs in a patient with uveal melanoma over time. This patient was treated with a nucleation for a stage 3A ciliary body melanoma 
with high-risk molecular prognostic profile based upon tumor biopsy. CHC levels initially decreased from baseline at one month postoperatively, but then showed a dramatic increase at six months, shortly after which the patient was found on surveillance imaging to have developed widespread metastases involving both the liver and lungs. While preliminary, our data are encouraging, and we are currently investigating uveal melanoma hybrid cells across the metastatic cascade in primary and metastatic tumors as well as in circulation. We continue our Melanoma Research Foundation funded work investigating CHCs as a novel diagnostic biomarker and hope to learn about metastasis in this disease through study of these cells. I look forward to sharing more of this work with you in the future. Thank you.